First, I want to say thank you to the MIT Forum for having myself here and the rest of the panelists here. I'm really excited to talk about what I do, which is mainly data science, and how it fits in with robotics and autonomous machines. So to start with, I am, as, as Matt said, the Vice President of Data Science at Zephyr. Zephyr is a video ad tech company. What we do is associate YouTube videos with ads. So if you ever watch YouTube and watch an ad first and thinks, wow, that doesn't suck, I might have done my job. And so what we really want to do is figure out how to get away from pure audience targeting. So everyone here that has a phone, that their ad follows them from their phone to their apps to their computers, that's audience targeting. And we align with the context, the ad, the video, excuse me. Prior to that, I ran data science at eHarmony. There I was in charge of matching, who got matched with who, pricing, uh, fraud modeling, and churn modeling. I have a PhD in biomedical engineering where I focused on machine learning methods and brain MRI. And I had a startup that did the same thing in radiation oncology. So my background is data science, machine learning. I was a data scientist before that term was popular. So as I was writing this presentation, I wanted to start with kind of a brief history of robots. This is for my own edification as much as anyone else's. So the term was actually coined in the 1920s from a Czech play. All that it meant was machines that did work that people didn't want to. And our fascination with robots as a society is a lot older than that. So this is an early robot. I don't know if anyone has seen this picture before, but it's called the Turk. It was, it toured around Europe in the mid 1600s, sorry, 1700s and 1800s, and around America as well. And the presentation is you'd set up, up to a chessboard, and you would play chess, and all you would see is the pieces moving. And the Turk, is what it called, would frequently win. Well, the way that it worked is there was somebody who was hiding underneath the board with a magnet who could see through who was moving the pieces. Right? But this, whole, this was a robot in the sense of the word, and it was autonomous. It was just powered by a person. Right? Robots have been in our lives for a lot longer. This is the CyberKnife, the first FDA-approved robotic uh, element in the OR. And we have Osimo, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, a bipedal robot from Honda. Um, Robotics is really all about the study of controlling robots. And there's lots of different ways that, that this happens. Some of the most rudimentary ways are some industrial robots, where every single movement is pre-programmed. Right? This is from Honda, actually, in the early 80s. And the way these robots worked is all the actuators and motors and everything was pre-programmed, and it were very, very good at doing one very, very specific task, in this case, assembling a car. And not only an assembly of a car, assembling a very specific piece of a car. More sophisticated ro robotics involves what's called path planning. This is Shaky the Robot. Shaky the Robot was developed out of Stanford from the mid-60s to the mid-70s. And what its job was to use different sensors it had, television cameras, um, bump sensors, RF sensors, to navigate around an environment. This robot led to a lot of inventions. One of the most famous inventions that came out of this study was ASTAR. So anyone that's a computer scientist out there has probably heard of the algorithm ASTAR. It's a greedy search algorithm that I know I studied in school and I still use now every now and then. And it was actually developed because of the work with this particular robot. When we think of path planning, we can really break it down into four different stages. There's sensing, which I think a lot of our panelists are going to touch on, which is what's out there. There's localization, which is where am I? There's representation, sorry, representation is where am I? Localization is what else is around me? And then actuation, how do I move? So there's, this is one of the ways that they can do this. This is usually broken down into either deterministic methods, like ASTAR, like we want to search through a space and find our way around it, and probabilistic like Markov decision processes, if anyone's heard of these. And it's just how we don't actually know exactly where we're going to move, but we have probability maps we move over. And this leads into kind of another part that I'm going to talk about. Um, this is a fully machine learning robot. Yes, it's in a simulator. Uh, this is an experiment out of DeepMind, which is a subsidiary of Google, which is doing some of the coolest stuff right now, in my opinion, on the study of fully machine learning robot movements. So this little fella here, he has two legs and a torso. He was not told how to jump. He was not told how to run. He was not even told how to stand. All he was told was get from one side of this arena to the other. He learned all of this on his own, 
just because of an algorithm called reinforcement learning, which I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to take a step back and jump into machine learning. So this is my area of expertise. This is what I do every day. When I think about machine learning, I can really d break it down into three separate groups. The first is called supervised learning. So supervised learning is this idea that we have a data set and we want to understand it. And that data set is fully labeled. So an example of a supervised learning problem, from my own experience, would be eHarmony. One of the things we tried to do was say, given two people who had, we had matched, was that match successful? Did they talk? This is called classification. For every match, we have exactly two outcomes that can happen. Either they talked or they didn't. Most of the time they didn't, that's fine. Some of the time they did. We wanted to learn the signal, learn the features, so that we could predict for two new people who have never been matched, whether they'd be successful or not. Another type of fully supervised machine learning is regression. So a common application in regression is something like Zillow. Let's say we wanted to predict your home price. We wanted to predict a real value number, and we had a bunch of other homes in your neighborhood that had sold recently. This is regression. Everything is labeled, and we're predicting a real value number. Another, one of the, some of the state of the art in this kind of research is really in computer vision. And I know that some of the, the, the panelists are going to talk more about this using something called deep learning. Uh, deep learning is a form of machine learning where we stack many neural networks on top of each other into layers and try and learn complicated problems. This has really led to an explosion in the field. So some of the most practical applications of this are computer vision or speech recognition. So I'm sure everyone here has talked to their phone or taken a picture where Facebook says who this is. That's all deep learning. But it's all under the guise of fully supervised learning. Somebody's gone and made a training data set of labels. Another type of machine learning is called unsupervised machine learning. Here, all that we're given are features, in this case, two, an x and a y axis. And we said, given a bunch of points, cluster them. This is very hard. Uh, we don't see this a lot in industry because it's very vague. But some spots where we do see it in industry is stuff like topic modeling. So if we wanted to say, hey, for all of Wikipedia, tell us what it's about, or all of the New York Times, tell us what it's about. Uh, I know this is being used actively right now at the LA Times. I hosted a talk where one of the data scientists talked about how they're using DocNade, which is a neural network, to help do this exact kind of work, to find articles that are similar for recommendation. The last area I'm going to touch on is called semi-supervised learning. Here, we have some labeled data and some unlabeled data. So on the left side, you could see a labeled data and a decision plane you might make with that labeled data. And on the right side, what you see is a bunch more unlabeled data and another decision plane you might make. And so you could see how the unlabeled data could help us make a better decision. So this is going to lead me into reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is one of the state-of-the-art ways that robotics happens. So really what it is, in a nutshell, is you start with an agent, which may be a robot, which may be a simulation, which may be whatever you want. It interacts with an environment to maximize a reward. So a common thought experiment when we think about reinforcement learning is called the multi-arm bandit problem. So does any, has anyone heard of a one-arm bandit? It's a, a slot machine, right? So it, a multi-arm bandit thought problem goes like this. If I said, hey, here's a bunch of slot machines, and I said, go out and pull the levers, let's say 100 times, and make the most money. Well, you're the agent, the environment is the bank of slot machines, and your reward is how much money you get from each pull. Sometimes you get nothing, sometimes you get a lot. Your job is to interact with the environment, interact with the slot machines, such that after the 100 pulls, you've made the most money. What you would think about in this is this trade-off between exploration and exploitation. When we start, we know nothing. We pull randomly. Let's say we won. Do we pull that one again? Maybe it pays out the same amount. Maybe it doesn't. We don't know. As we pull more, we know more about our environment. We can exploit what we learned, or we can explore what we haven't learned yet. And this is really a form of semi-supervised machine learning because you don't know what would have happened if you had gone back and taken a different action at the same time. You can only receive the reward for the action you actually took. I've used RL actually in my professional life. So at eHarmony, we did something called dynamic pricing. This is very common for a lot of machine learning products and pricing products that you see online. So in this case, 
our action. So we had, a, we had a user who came to our pricing page. This particular one is in pounds, but the same thing is true in dollars. The goal was to say, what set of prices do we show these users such that we maximize the reward, the amount they spend? And we did this very successfully at eHarmony. Our, most of our pricing, by the time I left, was powered by reinforcement learning, by this application. But let's tie this back to robots. How, how does this actually tie back to robotics? So a robot doesn't need to be something in the physical world, although it can be. One of the most famous applications, or one of the most spectacular applications, I should say, that I've seen for robotics is out of DeepMind. Uh, this is an application to a game called Breakout. So this is an Atari game. Uh, DeepMind has solved a lot of games. <laughs> Um, basically, in breakout, you want to move the paddle left and right to knock a ball up to try and break all the blocks above. What's so interesting about this is that the only input to the algorithm was the pixels on the screen. The only thing the algorithm was told to do is generate the most points. It didn't know there was a paddle. It didn't know there was a ball. It didn't know anything like that. It learned it totally on its own using reinforcement learning. If you see it learn, it starts to move the paddle randomly, then it starts to hit the ball, then it starts to hit the ball so that it hits all the blocks. It's very interesting. Another application of this is board games. So stuff like backgammon, chess, and most recently Go have been solved by reinforcement learning. AlphaGo, which is something that was in the news a couple months ago, beat the best Go player in the world using reinforcement learning. Another application, self-driving cars. So we want to have an action, which is the actions might be accelerate or brake or turn or whatever we want to do. Some reward, get me to my destination without crashing, right? So get me to my destination is a positive reward, crashing is a negative reward. And we have an environment, in this case, the physical environment. Another form of reinforcement learning is actually us. This is how we all learn. So think of this girl. When she was learning how to drink the water, no one told her as a baby exactly how to move her shoulder and her arm and her wrist and put it up and open her mouth. She just had something she wanted to do. She wanted to get water in her mouth. When she started, she probably knocked the glass over, spilled it on her face. Those were all negative rewards. Eventually, she, through a bunch of random actions, figured out how to grasp the glass and put it in her mouth. That's a positive reward. This behavior is reinforced. So reinforcement learning is really something that I'm very passionate about, that we see a lot as a connection between machine learning and robotics, in addition to deep learning. So where I'm going to leave it here, and then I'm going to call it the first speaker, is autonomous robots. Kind of the state of the art is it's a highly complicated array of sensors and motors. Um, and I, a lot of our panelists are going to go into that. Uh, the two state of the art approaches that I see in the industry are path planning, both dynamic and probabilistic, and reinforcement learning. And really what ties all these together for successful applications to advance robotics is simulations. So if you have a high-tech way to do lots of simulations, this is self-driving cars or video games, you really see a lot of success in robotics. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Yasmin, who's going to come up and talk about her work at UCSB. Um, so I'm a professor at UCSB. I run a research lab that works at the intersection of robotics and wireless communication. And I just want to briefly tell you about some of the exciting possibilities for autonomous sensing and learning about the environment at this intersection. So the first technology I want to talk to you about is enabling X-ray vision. Is it possible to give X-ray vision to unmanned vehicles uh, with only Wi-Fi signals and, oh, I see some, I don't know what happened there, with only Wi-Fi signals and, uh, and robots. So we have here two autonomous air vehicles. They're flying outside of this area. So we've sent them here. They've never been here before. And they want to image everything through these concrete walls. So they only have wireless signals, Wi-Fi on board, let's say. So one is transmitting wireless signal, the other one is measuring the receptions. Is it possible to image all the details through walls with only Wi-Fi signals? So in my lab, we have worked on this problem for a long time and developed um, some new theories that show that through proper um, communication and path planning for these unmanned vehicles, they can actually image through walls, to, through these such thick concrete walls, with only wireless signals. So if we go to the um, next slide, so you may wonder, OK, so it's cool. Extra vision is cool. So what are some of the applications? And there are a lot of possible applications for it. 
Um, so for instance, search and rescue um, after, um, let's say there is an earthquake, afterwards you may want to send their unmanned vehicles to be able to build a situational awareness, image through walls before you send uh, you know, um, the people in. Um, so structural health monitoring is another good example. Can you send these unmanned vehicles to high up bridges and they be able to image through and be able to figure out cracks or things that basically the, where the structure is uh, um, de uh, deteriorating? Another example I like is whenever I go to Mexico, there are always these Ma uh, Mayan pyramids that basically were covered under foliage for a long time. Nobody knew about them and all of a sudden somebody discovered them. Wouldn't it be great? if you can send on man air vehicle, and basically they can image through um, and basically um, detect them. Or in general, in general robotics application, um, we envision that in future you would send a team of unmanned vehicles, um, you give them a, a mission to do, um, and they need to build an understanding of the environment in terms of mapping and imaging. And so if they have the ability to also image through walls, which is not enabled by carrying sensors on the, of the robots, like the vision sensors, then essentially they can do a lot more. So we've developed the, 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 the theories and shown this is possible. And so, but before that, actually, let me say this is really challenging. So when we talk about X-ray vision, we think about medical imaging that is typically at a um, really high frequency, specialized equipment, and that, it, that cannot do through um, like the brick walls or concrete walls. That's just through soft tissue. Um, so, the main challenge is that when there's a transmission, that transmission goes through the object in the environment. So, in principle, you can think of the objects leaving their signature on that transmission. But the information of all these objects, all these signatures, they will be all mixed up in the received signal. And so, it will be very hard to extract the information of the objects from a wireless transmission. Um, so. We've developed theories to show that how to basically extract that information, separate the information of all the objects. And so I'm going to show you some sample results. Um, so here, this is the area that we send these unmanned vehicles. So they basically flew around. Uh, so this is what was inside. Basically, one of them will be transmitting a wireless signal, and the other one will be receiving a wireless signal. These are just Wi-Fi signals on board. And they were basically traversing the paths that we came up with for them. And this is basically the top view of the area. This is the uh, ground truth um, of it. And this is basically how they imaged the area. Two walls. They've never been here. They just send Wi-Fi measurements. And so it's not perfect. We don't expect it to be perfect. But this is um, the first demonstration of really 3D imaging true walls with only Wi-Fi signals that is enabled by unmanned vehicles. So we've been very excited about um, these kind of results. And, um, and basically, um, I can show you a little bit more results. These are some of our earlier results, if you can play the video. These are in 2D with ground vehicles. And so these are the routes that these ground vehicles are taking. Um, and this is basically uh, now a 2D imaging uh, in our earlier results. But this is basically indication of material property, although we're not at the moment focusing on that. Well, we're translating it to a black and white thing, which would indicate if there's an object there or not. So you can see that as they collect more measurements, the image improves. And so basically, they do four routes. We collect those measurements. They use the methodology that we came up with to process the data. And this is basically how they image that area. Um, and so this was the original thing, and this is how they image it. These are some of our earlier results, so it's a little bit lumpier now. We can do it uh, smoother. And then we spend a lot of time. The most painful part of our lab is building structures, paying students and undergrads to come help us build new structures so we can understand the extent of to what extent we can do the imaging. But the students are too rich. They, they don't want to get paid to do this. So here they would put two things inside, and they were able to image it. And then um, this, is my, uh, this was my main PhD student on this project um, a couple of years ago. And he goes in, and he basically gets uh, is a blob here, and he becomes this blob here. Um, but you can see the dimensions and everything are um, imaged correctly. Um, so now that brought us into. What are the other possibilities with these wireless signals? Wi-Fi signals, let's say, are everywhere these days. Um, we're bombarded by these signals. So can they 
Say other things about the environment. For instance, can they count the number of people in, in an area? Can a wireless link here count how many people are here without relying on people's devices? Without relying on that. That's what we call passively. Or can they, for instance, in an office environment, figure out the wireless links, figure out the concentration of people and optimize heating and cooling, maybe? Maybe in a retail store, can they figure out the uh, flow of people, the customers, from one area to another? So can they do store analytics? Or in your home, you know, a lot of connected devices. Can they uh, basically figure out that it was you that came in now and optimize some of your play your favorite music or so on, or they do intruder detection. And the main advantage would be that if you compare this with vision, this preserves privacy and also has see-through potentials, so see-through imaging and see-through count. So, so we spend a lot of time in my lab uh, to basically do um, RF sensing, sensing with uh, everyday radio frequency signals for such applications. And I'm going to give you some examples of some of our results. So one thing we've looked at a lot is cloud counting with only Wi-Fi. So imagine here, and these robots are just being, uh, they're not being used to move, just the Wi-Fi card on them. So there's a Wi-Fi transmitter here and a receiver on this one. And then um, we're, we're going to have some people. So these people are walking around here. And the, receive, uh, the, receiver, um, the receiver card is just measuring his received power, which is very easy. It's a basic thing you can measure in any device. You can measure it on your laptop. It's called RSSI measurement. It's, it's very easy to measure. So very cheap, very easy to measure. Can we use just this signal and count how many people were in this area without relying on people's devices, just based on how people's movements is affecting the link? Okay? So, Again, so we've looked a lot at developing the underlying theories for this and see how much information there is. And actually, we've shown that that is uh, possible. And so um, not only is it possible to count in that setting, you can also count through walls. So I'm going to just show you some results. So, um, uh, so when we play this video, there is a Wi-Fi transmitter on this side, a Wi-Fi receiver on this side behind this, these walls. And then people are going to, uh, there will be some people in this area. And you can see that people walking, and they're being counted. Um, and uh, basically, there is actual, I have to also mention, there's no prior also training or anything. There's no prior measurement collected. This is another area with wooden walls. Again, you see it gets very crowded. People can zigzag each other a lot. But they're counted pretty well. And again, this is an, another area with 20 people. It gets pretty packed, but they're counted as 90. So, so in summary, basically, there are a lot of possibilities. A lot of things these um, signals can learn about the environment. So it's quite exciting. We, we can actually also do other things. Um, for instance, we can do um, crowd speed estimation. Again, passively. So um, in this example, we invited some people. We put two exhibits um, up um, in, the, in, our, in our building uh, in the, uh, on the first floor. So in one exhibit, we put um, kind of mundane pictures, like the ones up here. And the other one, we put visually uh, engaging pictures, like where's Waldo? The idea was that people are going to spend more time on where's Waldo. They're going to slow down. And we wanted to see, and then we put a Wi-Fi link, and wanted to see if this Wi-Fi link can estimate the speed of people in both areas, although it was just in one area. Um, so. So people came and they just looked through. They didn't know what the goal was. And so people were walking in the, in the not very exciting exhibit. Um, they were walking a little bit faster than the typical walking speed, around a meter per second. Um, and uh, it was estimated as a meter per second. And people slowed down in the more interesting um, exhibit. And it was also estimated as it was slowed down. So. Um, so basically, you can also uh, estimate the speed of a crowd. And then we also did some experiments in our local Costco to see if we could extend these to estimate the flow rate uh, of people, what arrival rate of the people, uh, buyers to different, um, different aisles, as well as their speed. And, and actually, we could uh, successfully do that. This particular aisle was um, the aisle with cookies. So people did slow down, and so it was estimated as slow down. 
So a lot of really, really exciting possibilities with these signals um, that uh, you can do. Uh, and so in my lab, we're very interested in, in understanding what else is possible, what else can you extract from these everyday um, communication signals that are everywhere, and also what kind of uh, new opportunities that will give to unmanned vehicles for sensing. Of course, we also scared the, the news. Um, the Huffington Post said that government is going to now use Wi-Fi to count how many people are in the room. And New York Post said drones with Rex Vision are going to come to spy on all of us. So we had some interesting interaction uh, with the news as well. So with that, I'm just going to, I always like to acknowledge some of the students that were involved in the work as well as the funding agency. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Tim LeBeau from Seek Thermal, and uh, I'm going to talk about a really scary t topic of uh, robots. Um, thankfully, I grew up in the area where I watched a lot of Jetsons, so I'm not really afraid of robots. I'm still looking forward to uh, getting my meals served by robots, but uh, I'll move on from that. Uh, you know, if robots are taking over, and they are, uh, our real goal is to make them as safe as possible and as smart as possible. So how's that going to happen? Well, I'll get into that here. You know, there's been a lot of technology predictions, and technology, maybe not a lot of people in this room, but a lot of people in the areas you fly over on the way from here to New York think that it's very, very um, scary and dangerous. But there's been a lot of interesting technology predictions over time. You know, you look at back, uh, the telephone has too many shortcomings to be a serious consideration of means of communication. That's from the head of uh, Western Union. When was the last time anyone in here used Western Union? Exactly. Fooling around with alternating current is just a waste of time. Nobody will ever use it. Thomas Jefferson, he stole it from a guy named Tesla later on and became pretty successful. The horse is here to stay, but the automobile is a novelty, a fad. Uh, that was um, uh, Henry Ford's lawyer. I just spent most of my day today with our lawyers, and I understand why they take money and not stock. This guy probably did, didn't take too much Ford stock. <clears throat> Remote shopping, while entirely feasible, will flop. Um, said Jeff Bezos' wife. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry, that was Time Magazine in 1966. Um, there is no chance the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. Uh, some guy from C uh, Microsoft said that. Um, and this one is my favorite one. Robots uh, will never replace human drivers. It is just too unsafe. So I just drove up from L.A. on the way up here, and I saw about 12 car accidents, so I disagree with that. Uh, but we'll get into that. So let's look at the facts. What's going on in the automotive space? Well, injury. Every 1.25 seconds, someone in the globe gets in a car accident. In Europe, it's every uh, 29 seconds. In the United States, it's every 13.2 seconds someone is injured in a car accident. Smoking, everyone believes smoking is bad for you. Causes about, um, about uh, uh, $300 billion in health care in the United States. Car accidents, $435 billion cost the healthcare system in the United States. It's, it's, it's insane. Fatalities, um, every 25 seconds globally reported, someone dies in a car accident. Uh, Europe, every 20 minutes. In the United States, every 13 minutes, someone dies in a car accident or a car crash I should, uh, in the United States, which is an insane number. Um, we talk about technology, something that used to, a computer used to take up the size of your kitchen, it cost the amount of your house. Now it takes up the size of your palm and costs as much as a frying pan. We think we've made all these great advances in technology, but cars are still kind of left behind, and they're super dangerous. But let's talk about fatalities. Only 56%, I say it only lightly, of people who die in car crashes are actually inside the car. And there's been great advances in airbags and, and side impact and all that other fun stuff. But... Um, 15% of people who die in car crashes are on motorcycles, and a staggering 29% of people who die as a result of car crashes are pedestrians. You know, I'm a motorcyclist. I have to wear a helmet, according to the state of California, to drive a motorcycle. But I could just walk down the street, no problem, without a helmet. And uh, they let me do that, which is nice. But it's super unsafe. So let's dive into that a little bit more. <clears throat> when, did, when did the people in, in uh, pedestrians die? 3% uh, dawn and dusk, 22% um, at night, I'm sorry, during the day. 75% of people, pedestrians die, die when it's dark. Does anyone know why? Well, they don't, they can't see them. No, no time that has anyone ever got in a car accident and say, yeah, I totally saw that guy, and I hit him anyways. <laughs> it's usually like, I didn't see him. I wish I had a way of seeing them. You just can't, you can't see him, it's scary. 
So the solution is that really the correct data from the right sensors will enable robots to be safer. And when I talk about robots, I think a car is a robot. I mean, that's what it is. Um, a lot of people think a robot is a, a weird looking structure, but your car more and more is turning into a robot. We, we need to embrace that. So humans have five senses. I think robots need six senses too. Some people in the audience may talk, five senses, may talk about the sixth sense. That's not really important right now. Um, so we need technology for safer robots. So there's a role for each of these sensors. You have, of course, ultrasound. A lot of people have this in their car right now. It's great for backup detection, not hitting cars when you're parallel parking. Thankful for that. I don't have too many dents in my car now. Um, visible cameras are great, but have huge limitations. For example, I can't see at night. I can't see certain things. I don't know if that's a shadow or an actual branch. Um, radar is great for certain things in and around the car, down the road. It has a lot of limitations as well. LiDAR is another great thing. It's like driving with a seeing eye stick. It's super, super great, but it has some issues. Then thermal, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about thermal, but thermal combined with all the other four senses really pr pr provides a driving solution for robotic cars that will make driving safer than humans driving themselves. And that's where really we want to get to. And that's really what's important. So what is thermal imaging? Thermal imaging actually sees heat around you. Everything around you emits heat. Uh, think of even ice cubes emit heat, absolute heat. Anything above zero Kelvin is something that emits heat. And thermal imaging could uh, see that data and use that data to make driving and a lot of other things a lot safer. Thermal imaging is kind of on, uh, on the infra in the um, spectrum. It's just outside of what's visibly available for your human eyes. And uh, it's had a lot of interesting history. So in Santa Barbara, thermal imaging has been developed for heat-seeking missiles, Patriot missiles, things of that nature. And the cost of this technology has come down dramatically over time. The big dig on thermal imaging is, oh, it's too expensive. But we've seen it in Santa Barbara go from $300,000 to $50,000 to $20,000, $10,000, $5,000. And now it's going to be so inexpensive that it's going to be available everywhere. And you're going to be able to see it and use it every day several times. So right now, it's got typical applications as far as diagnostics. People use it for um, uh, monitoring the electrical grid, looking at servers. Um, PG&E wishes they used it a lot more up in Northern California. Public safety, it's great for fire and rescue. Right now, only 5% of all firefighters have access to thermal imaging. That's changing. In the next three years, that number is going to be closer to 50%. Security surveillance, <clears throat> I say animal detection because that's the politically correct way of saying hunting, um, which is a great way for that. Um, but like I said, everything around you has heat signature, so in cars, you've got to really see. Cause when you're driving down this is State Street, you know, where is the person? Can you see them? But in thermal, they pop right out. And a little bit of uh, machine learning will actually help you acknowledge that and do something about it. Um, you see what you see in the visible, so you'll drive right through that stop sign not knowing there's a person there, but in reality, there is someone there. So heat signatures will tell you that there's someone there and help you avoid hitting them. Uh, anyone in here jog? Worst thing you could do, especially in Isla Vista. Uh, people jog down the street, get hit all the time. Don't drive, don't jog between the cars and the, parked and the cars driving, you will get hit. Um, parking lot, Costco parking lot, the guy out pushing the carts, the kids running around, super unsafe. Uh, don't let your kids run around Costco at night, parking lot. Uh, just vehicle awareness, driving down the street, where are the cars, what are they doing, which one's swerving, who's drunk, um, helps you understand that. Computers could see that and understand that. Uh, as the sun's going down, you hate to live uh, and work where you're driving into the sunrise in the morning and driving home at night. It's a big issue. Where are the people? Up, oh, there's a person right there walking up between the car and the, and the sun. You can't see them. Thermal imaging will help you do that. Uh, visible. Uh, LiDAR can't tell the difference between a five-year-old and a fire hydrant. Thermal imaging can. They act totally different. So you got to be able to know which one's which and to be able to determine how you act appropriately. Turning blind spot, this is right by my street. The kids drive their skateboards down the street all the time. As I'm turning, didn't see them, but when you see them in thermal, it's pretty amazing. Um, backup cameras, the lady walking her dog at night behind your car, it's nice to see them before you back into them, uh, I found. Um, even inside the car, determining uh, <coughs> driver alertness. You can see that's someone who's alert, that's someone who's not alert. 
It also can predict male pattern baldness, which is a really great uh, <laughs> side application that we're working on. Um, Tempe, Arizona. Anyone know what happened in Tempe, Arizona? Um, do you know that three other people died in Arizona that week? No one knows about that. Um, 110 uh, years to the day that uh, Paul Suffrage was the first person who died in a plane crash, the first person died in an um, uh, automotive, uh, automotive uh, driving situation. Uh, the Wright brothers said, let's keep going. Google said, let's, let's, let's stop, let's slow down. So it's kind of strange. But, uh, you know, so we recreated that, and you could see at 300 feet, or 5.1 seconds for impact, you just can't tell there's a person there. Um, as you keep going, 250 feet, the, ther the visible can't tell there's a person there. Thermal is saying, yeah, there's someone there, you better be careful. As you get to 200 feet, it becomes even more apparent that there's someone there using machine learning and thermal imaging data, but you can't tell uh, with visible. 150 feet, still can't tell. It takes you two seconds to stop a car when you see a, something out there going this speed. And even if a regular person was driving this, they couldn't even tell there was someone there. It wasn't until 100 feet or 1.7 seconds, which is below the threshold of a human stopping, that you could even have an indication that there might be a hazard there that you might need to stop in front of. Thermal, again, could tell a lot further. So as we kept creating the data, um, you know, as we live in a time, it's interesting to start seeing all these things around you. And it's cool to know that we're in the verge of a time where technology is going to be able to make robots and cars safer, and not just for the driver, for the pedestrian as well. So, you know, machines are taking over the world, and that's actually a good thing. And we should embrace that and, and drive that and support that. And I'm glad that MIT and the forum here supports that, and uh, I look forward to making the world and the cars safer. That's it. Uh, my name is Paul Willard. I am a venture capital investor at Storm Ventures. We are an early stage enterprise software fund, including robotics as a service. And I'm going to explain that statement. <laughs> yeah, the time for robots is now. I tried to put all robots that are actually out there in the world uh, working today. I have kind of an unusual background. And I think that my background has helped me develop a framework for what robotics are going to be successful coming next. And, and I use that investing. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about it and tell you about that lens. I started off as a hardware engineer. I was an aerodynamics engineer at Boeing. And among other things, I worked on autonomous airplanes in the 1990s. I moved over during Internet 1.0 uh, to software startups. Worked for four in a row and really learned the ins and outs of quickly growing a software startup. And then I switched to investing where I finally came full circle, never thought I'd see hardware again, and I invested in a couple robotics companies that I'll talk about. <laughs> robots have been around for a long time. John mentioned it earlier. Uh, in pop culture, in automotive is, I think, what everybody thinks of as the first really big industrial robots. This is Dark Star. This is a, a declassified autonomous airplane that could fly around all by itself, not remote control, and take pictures of things that you asked it to take pictures of uh, from up in the sky, 1990s, pre-internet, common with at least these two that were actually real robots. Really expensive beasts to develop, really heavy capital kind of businesses. This time's different because that's not what's happening today. And it's not happening today because of commoditized hardware. One thing that I came to realize when I worked at software companies is that all software was enabled and built because of commoditized hardware. Only once a, a, a piece of hardware is coming off an assembly line does it open up a market that wasn't open before to develop software on. So for instance, when mainframes were developed and bought by big companies, there was suddenly a market to build software for big companies. When the personal computer put a, a computer on everybody's desk at work, really, first in the beginning, now you could build software for people at work. The World Wide Web, that's, this is a big rack of web servers for, for those that haven't seen those from, from early internet days, but um, brought that to our houses. And now suddenly we could make software, thanks to the hardware that was commoditized, that lives in all of our houses and does things for us at home. The last mile device is the mobile phone. And the mobile phone, you know, billions of people worldwide, always with us, lose our car keys, but not our phone. <laughs> Um, has truly made software models and business models available for anybody that you want to build software for. 
I want to talk about the hardware that's been commoditized that's making robotics go right now really hard, in my opinion. And I think the reason why you're seeing so many come through. Lithium-ion batteries came from laptops, and, and that's, that's what made them commoditized. Uh, both chips as well as wireless communication came from both laptops as well as mobile phones. As well, the mobile phones also brought us a ton of really cool sensors. The easy and obvious ones are like cameras. You know, video cameras used to be expensive, um, but thanks to the phones, they're not anymore. Uh, also got GPS, which is a good one. Some that you don't see as much, but we engineers love are inertial reference units that tell phones how they're moving around or how you're moving around if your phone's in your pocket. Um, as well as other sensors. Uh, very high torque, highly reliable motors didn't really uh, get commoditized until Tesla. Tesla was the one that was brave enough that said, we, we can make super duper cars out of these beasts because we can make them affordable enough by, by uh, mass producing and commoditizing the beasts. Oh, so. Another thing you might not be able to see from the outside, but, but a real effect is that software comes with all of these. So when you roll out the first lithium-ion battery, you don't have a battery controller. It's, it's sort of like a research project, if you will. But by the time the, the lithium-ion battery gets commoditized, it has a battery management system software that you can modify to your specific application. The, the beauty of the software, you know, simultaneous localization and mapping for uh, GPS and other sensors, cameras and lots of other sensors, motor controllers. All this software lets you build something with this now inexpensive hardware much faster and much less expensively than you could have before. These, a lot of these are like open source stuff. Two of the most famous ones for robots are the robot operating system, built open source software built by a group called Willow Garage. And almost all the little robot companies that are building moving robots are using that software to help them get faster for less, with less money. TensorFlow is neural net software for, for AI uh, that Google open sourced. And, and there are other packages too. But the bottom line is you, you can get up and running much more quickly and for a lot less money now than you used to be able to. It's really hard. You better be really smart. You better know how to apply all these tools. But you can do it. And if you are one of those best roboticists in the world, you can do it for much less capital than before. You put them all together, and you can build really remarkable applications. So the first robot company that I invested in was a company called Zipline. And Zipline builds autonomous airplanes. It was like right back to the beginning for me, right? <laughs> At orders of magnitude lower cost than the autonomous airplanes that I worked on in the 1990s. The autonomous airplanes deliver blood and medicine in Rwanda, where the roads are not good. They can deliver the blood really, really quickly. So quickly, in fact, that the brilliant Minister of Health in Rwanda has devised an inventory system that has saved thousands of mothers after childbirth and kept them from bleeding to death. That's how fast the blood can get there. She's a genius for the way that she applied this robotics capability, but the, the bottom line is this is only possible because of all that hardware and software commoditization that I've been talking about. And so if I look at this lens and I say, this is really just software disruption all over again, what other kind of applications are, are interesting and do I see coming? And I'll, I'll start with one more dimension on here. And that's how hard or simple are these things to operate, right? Vacuuming. Dis disruption's great, right? You do sort of a simpler thing on the relative scale, but that provides a lot of value. I have a Roomba. I don't know about everybody here. But um, Roombas are easy enough to, for me to operate as a non-expert. I can plug it into the wall, set it loose, do its thing, right? That tends to be own hardware, so that's, that's a classic hardware company. We build it, we sell it to you for a fixed price, you're done. There's another class of robots, though, that are doing really useful things. Zipline's one of them. Another is, that, that I'll talk about is Cobalt Robotics. These are indoor office security robots. They patrol offices all night, and they make sure that they're secure and safe. A uh, lot more complex to operate than a Roomba. And in fact, their, their customers, these businesses, they don't want to become experts at operating these types of robots. These types of robots are rented because they want the company that built them to operate them for them. We call it robotics as a service, RAS. Remarkably close to another software term we call SaaS, which is software as a service. 
software is remarkably close because if you kind of squint your eyes and look at them, both the business models as well as a lot of the execution models turn out to feel a lot the same. The big difference in the sort of hard thing, if you haven't ever worked in hardware before, is being able to evaluate the hardware and say, yes, commodity software that, or hardware that exists today can do these things, or no, that's a little bit hard. That's, that, that's got hardware risk in it, with, and that's a different kind of beast. It's not the kind that go out in the world today. <laughs> so because of that, uh, my enterprise software fund invests in robotics. I talked about Cobalt and Zipline already. Another interesting thing, though, is that's all applicable to non-robots, too, as far as investing in what's going to do well. In fact, there's other kinds of stuff, uh, hardware, in this case, a, a virtual reality goggle, commoditizing as we speak. Uh, and Limbix is a company that we invested in that's building virtual reality uh, scenarios for mental health so that a therapist can literally provide exposure therapy to you in a safe and cost-effective way. And so more and more hardware is being commoditized faster and faster. It's accelerating. So more and more markets are coming. Every time any hardware and software gets commoditized, it breeds the next, the, the next wave and the next layer. So I hope that's a helpful lens. So I'm going to go ahead and start um, with one that will kind of transition on what you had just talked about, which is why now? You talked about the hardware's cheaper and the, the software's coming with it. But how long will it really take before we see, and more importantly, feel a massive transition? So why don't we start with Yasmin? OK, so why now? Well, so if you look at, for instance, um, DARPA Grand Challenge, um, so that was uh, basically a competition to start autonomous vehicles. Uh, if you look at it, uh, the first competition was like 2004. And at that point, the whole thing was about building this sensing part and getting the unmanned vehicles to understand the environment really well. So that took a while. In fact, the first DARPA Grand Challenge, um, no team was able to really make any progress. But then we nailed down the sensing with cheap embedded sensors, a lot of data, powerful computation that allows for a lot of learning. So those parts have all come, to pick, uh, come, come, come together with advances in sensing and computation um, and communication. So that's why we're, we're here now. To, we're, we're starting to really imagine these unmanned vehicles as part of our lives or driving in an autonomous vehicle is, 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 is becoming more and more reality. Um, so now what your next part was like, and how long more will it take? Um, so I'm in academia. I don't like giving <laughs> <laughs> definite answer. But I think what's difficult, I would say, for um, essentially in terms of autonomy, when we talk, think about robots, is now the actuation part a lot. When we especially talk about um, human robots, um, like opening a door, and you're getting through a door, I mean, that's very challenging. So in robotics, the, the part that is, is really uh, still needs to mature a lot is the actuation part. The sensing part has made a lot of uh, advances, so the actuation part has to catch up for those type of applications that would need that. So that's cool. my concern. Um, do you guys want to jump in, or should yeah. we'll keep going? Cool. So let's kind of stay on that topic of the future. Um, what do you guys think is the limit? Do you guys foresee a future where stuff has to be done by humans? Um, Tim, why don't you take this one? Uh, I guess there will always be things that <clears throat> have to be done by humans. But uh, you know, I look at efficiencies and safety and things of that nature and things like, well, why, why would it need to be done by humans? Uh, that's where I push it and I look at it like you know, cars, uh, the electrical grid, there's certain things that are so unsafe right now and people don't even realize the level of, uns of, of how unsafe they are. <clears throat> but technology and machine learning and automation is really going to step in and say, let's make this safer, let's make this easier, and let's take the human element out of it. Cool. Um, let's stay on that and, and ask uh, Paul, what commercial markets have the biggest potential to use robots? Uh, How will that change in the next 5, 10, 20, 50, 100 years? <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know if I can get that far. <laughs> um, you know, disruption's a funny thing, right? And, and uh, I'm lucky. I don't actually have to figure out what 
disruption is the best right now. I can just kind of kick back and wait while really smart people come in and explain to me why the thing that they're about to do is the next disruption. I, all I have to do is recognize that they're really smart and they're right. <laughs> <laughs> but that said, I mean, you're seeing a ton in logistics right now uh, and, and moving things around and moving people around in autonom autonomous vehicles. And I think logistics use one sort of for safety as well, but a, a superhuman capability of software in general is that it doesn't get tired, it doesn't get bored, it doesn't like slow down or stop working or work any worse, no matter how monotonous or terrible a job you give it. It just does it. And so for logistics, it's sort of a yeah. handy uh, little beast of an area for it. Um, what, what comes next is gonna be interesting, right? Because like the research that Yasmin was just working on Somebody's going to take that, and they're going to go figure out something to do with it that none, I don't think any of us could come up with today. <laughs> it's going to be just brilliant. And, and so I think you, we're going to see these things continue to evolve. It's like, I see it, it's like a forest fire. You don't know, forgive me, you don't know which tree is going to burn next until you see which tree burns hot today. Mm. And, and I think logistics is kicking it off, but we're going to see it continue to, to move through lots of areas. We'll go through all uh, the areas. What do you think, Yasmin? For, so... Again, I go by what's available now. I feel things that are less demanding on actuation are more possible. So that's why autonomous vehicles, uh, automation in factories, uh, Amazon dropping off our mail with uh, primary, those are more possibilities. But things that are like, oh, can I have a cook you know, in the house? That demands more fine motor skills and actuations. That may take longer. Um, I don't know, politics in future, I don't know. Can <laughs> politicians replaced by robots, I don't know, just me. Um, but yeah, things that are more actuation, that is, that may take a little bit longer. And, and Tim, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, logistics is a big one. You know, I was just down in Southern California, all the trucks coming out of uh, Long Beach, driving to distribution centers in Iowa, and they're all driving it during rush hour, it makes no sense. The hardest thing to hire right now in the United States is long haul truck drivers. It's the most inefficient job, if you could possibly think of it. You know, to have robotics take a, 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 a container from Long Beach to Iowa makes so much sense. They could drive in off hours, not drive during rush hour, and it'd be a huge efficiency on uh, fuel as well as uh, road safety. But also in the home, you know, I'm on the road all the time. I love hitting a button and have, you know, my Roomba come out and vacuum my, uh, uh, my, my carpets, to have you know, my window shades go to a certain uh, point by robotics, having my music turn on to a certain way when I walk in the house and have all of my lighting a certain way is awesome. So I want to see that continue. Awesome. So let's stay on that topic. What would, outside of the stuff you had just mentioned, a future smart home, office, or city look like? You want to start, kick it well, off? I mean, things? smart home, you know, I mean, not really in Santa Barbara where the weather is usually at the same temperature, but where I used to live on the East Coast, uh, being on the road, I like to have the temperature go down to 50 degrees, not so low that it melts, it, it bursts my pipes. But when I come home, have it heated up, have my fireplace turned on, have the music I want to have listened to. I like to, you know, again, I'm a big Jetsons fan, so I'd love to have uh, my food ready for me when I get in the house and have my martini waiting for me on a platter by a robot, <laughs> as opposed to have to actually go make it myself. I think that'd be amazing. And Paul, do you see companies that are, act, that are activating in this space? And if so, how? Yeah, no, I think enterprise is often one of the first places that goes because the value propositions work so well. Um, today, mostly human augmenters. So I saw a robot today that a dentist can bolt onto your tooth and it'll drill a perfect little cat to put a crown onto that mates exactly another human, superhuman capability of robots is the precision and they can drill the shape of your tooth within 100 microns of the size of the crown that they're popping on. And they can do it in five minutes versus two hours. So it, it, make, it turns a dentist into a super dentist. And I think you'll see a lot of applications of robotics like that that take advantage of the superhuman computer capabilities. Awesome, very cool. Uh, let's move on to a slightly more technical topic. I know, Yasmin, you work a lot with sensors and Wi-Fi sensors. So what sensors are important now? What do you think is going to be important in the future? Maybe Wi-Fi and outside of that, too. Yeah, so for robots, uh, uh, 
on man vehicle, an unmanned vehicle, of course, vision is really important. Um, but when we think of sensors these days, we don't really think of like the traditional ones, like uh, we've been using RF signals as sensors, things that are everywhere um, these days. Or social media is a sensor, right? So f the information we provide, like you know, is collected in that manner. Um, so. But for a, if you talk about a typical unmanned vehicle, the sensors it uses, the vision localization is also super important also, um, you know, but I'm always excited about these new things that are, nobody would, was thinking about them as sensors. But now we're using them as sensors, like the Wi-Fi signals that are everywhere, things that, you know, because we want connectivity, we have, we are bombarded by them. And now actually, they're starting to learn a lot of things about us so we can exploit them as sensors. You know, add to that. Sensors are super important because what do sensors do is they create data. And data is really the commodity. Data is now the most valuable commodity in the world, above oil. So you go to the beach here, you see all these platforms out there producing oil, and you're like, wow, that's interesting. But data is the most valuable resource. So what sensors produce data? How easy is it to process? How easy is it to transport? And what can you do with the data? That's where the real future of uh, value and technology is going to ride on, those the data. Cool. Do you want to? Cool. So let's stay on that segment as well. Um, so <laughs> data power is a lot of things, with artificial intelligence being an obvious application. Um, what are the business perspective and industries and segments that are using this data in, a, in an artificial intelligence way most effectively? Um, Paul, you want to start? Sure. <laughs> uh, tr like true, what I think when I hear AI, I think I think neural net. I have to admit, and the applications <laughs> That's that very I very biased. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I, I'm, bi I'm biased. <laughs> but. <laughs> Um, and the applications that I see using, or that I'm used for mostly uh, pertain to vision and with cameras today. I don't think that will always be the case. Um, and there's lots of others. In fact, in like 1994, we built a neural net at Boeing to help us predict drag on an airplane. So it's been applied in industrial settings for a long time. But in the startups I keep seeing, it, it's used mostly for vision and to, to identify vision-like sensor data. It, it can be... I like the version that you have where it's five types of data overlaid, but it's essentially right. being used to see. Well, data fusion is also going to be the key of all of that. So getting good data, not bad data, but good data from all these sensors <laughs> and be able to fuse it and to make it, have something that makes sense is going to be very important. Dude. Um, well, so AI, you need a lot of data, so the, that uh, uh, domains where there's, there's a lot of data that has the highest potential. So I imagine like uh, healthcare, where there's a lot of data from the um, patients, that's something that is uh, people were working on and just uh, helping that to do predictions and help with, in, in general, in the uh, health industry. Um, social media is another example. Vision, of course, is the biggest one. But in general, in, a, in the research side, um, it has become such that uh, there, there's a lot of work on just using AI for all sorts of things, even from path planning and trajectory planning or designing a coder and decoder for communication systems. Like, so there, there's a lot of push and excitement, but we have to see what would really make sense at the end uh, in that domain as well. So one of the things when I think about artificial intelligence, especially applied to robots, is it brings up a natural ethical question. Uh, something that we haven't touched about, but I think about sometimes. So I'm going to ask all of you, what do you think are the ethical implications you've already seen play out in business, and what are the ones you think that are forthcoming? So why don't we start with Tim and work down. Uh, you know, adding, you, providing all this data then start to overlay ethics is a really strange thing. Um, <laughs> you know, there's all these tests. You're driving down the street, would you rather hit an 80-year-old lady or a 14-year-old girl, right? Mm -hmm. Or I, I look at the situation of my wife, would she rather run over a dog or run into a tree, okay? She'd probably rather run into a tree because she loves dogs, but computers will tell you run over the dog and not hit the tree. So the complexity happens, though, in different cultures. There's a different level of ethics that apply to different cultures that don't necessarily apply to Americans. So certain things are more important than other things. So it's going to be really interesting to watch how you um, modify machines and data depending on the different ethics that the society has in different countries. Paul? Uh, the, I mean, the job issue is one that always comes up, especially as robots are doing more and more of these things. Um, and software changing 
uh, the job market is not a new thing, right? I would argue the laser printer took a lot of printers out of business, but it might have created a lot of graphic designers too, because we suddenly have a deck for everything when we didn't before. I guess the concern now, though, is that it's, it's this whole like Moore's Law thing, this whole exponential thing. It's accelerating. And whereas before we always had time to adjust society, society emotionally takes a little while to absorb and, and respond to these sorts of things. And I don't know that the software is going to give us that time for much longer to keep up. So I, I don't know what happens there. Do you want to comment? Well, something I see often in what I do is, uh, for instance, with the X-ray vision for unmanned vehicles, is that, OK, so well, now we can image through walls, and so you're, you can send these unmanned vehicles, and they can, you know, uh, well, it's not yet there, but if that's the uh, path in the future. So privacy issues, and so we hear that a lot with unmanned vehicles in general, being able to fly up high and take, you know, this, uh, uh, like high rise and be able to take uh, pictures through windows. Um, but it just seems like, so we have to keep up, in a sense, of coming up with rules and regulations because we really cannot stop the progress of, you know, scientifically what's possible. So we just have to figure out a way to keeping up with the technology. Hey, John, can I say one more thing in Please. defense of the robots for, for, <laughs> for just a second? Please, no, defend the robots. Sorry. A, a constrained robot, by the way, you can code to do a whole lot of ethically good things, like not discriminate and not harass people and not steal. Um, and so they have some serious upsides that can help society with ethics as well. But. And I will comment from my own personal research, you see this coming up at a lot of the preeminent machine learning conferences now, whole sections on fairness and ethics. It's, it's a really active research community. So this is something we think about quite a bit. Um, let's move back to some of the technical stuff. So what are the biggest technical hurdles to having unmanned uh, vehicles really make an impact on our lives? Please. I mean, I, I think I mentioned before, to, to me from what I see is, um, if we think about a robot and full autonomy, uh, actuation is really what is a bottleneck at the moment. We've made great progress on sensing actuation is an issue. Battery lifetime is another thing that, especially with like unmanned air vehicles, uh, so that is also another thing uh, that needs improvement. I, I mean, reliable safety yeah. to me. I I almost feel like I should leave that for you. That's what you talked about. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there, we, I think the technology is there. The thing that I really worry about is uh, government policy, actually. Okay. And uh, government policy is years behind where the technology is, and they're never going to catch up. I deal a lot with people in D.C. and Brussels and, you know, things, places like that. And they have no idea what technology is out there and what technology could really make things safer. And there's always this issue between... Department of Commerce and transportation and other things and you know this is technology we can't export and things like that's crazy. So my biggest concern is actually uh, policymakers in D.C. and Brussels and beyond. Hmm. Very interesting. I'll stay with the reliability. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> this is being recorded. The, the, the reliable safety, Easy. but you know, zipline is impacting lives in a very real way today. And, yeah. uh, Knock on wood, you know, they have, <laughs> they have yet to have a plane fall out of the so, sky outside of their test range. Fair <laughs> enough. So how do you guys control for stuff like failures and biases in the training set, which are certainly always there? I mean, I know we have simulators, and they're getting more and more powerful. And, but what else can you guys do to help control for that and really take something from a simulation into a real-life environment in such a way that it's safe and it's not biased? Um, so for failures, so... So one thing is, so um, to mention a lot the um, the car accidents, and it's very, um, it's the, so if we compare the modes of transportation, planes are about 100 times safer. Uh, like your chance of dying in a plane crash is, you know, um, 100 times less than a car. So uh, we should have all flown here today. Yeah, don't drive um, to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> don't walk either. <laughs> so, but when you look at the, the design, there's a lot of diversity. The design of the, when you look at the structure the, 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 um, of the um, of a plane, so what, what brings that safety is a lot of diversity, a lot of redundancies, basically. So, um, so if something fails, then you have you have a backup. So that is something that if you you know if you want to reduce the chance of failure, then you have to throw in more resources and, and basically have a lot more redundancy. I would say. Yeah, I say fail fast. I mean, failure is a good thing in innovation. 
We should fail, fail fast, learn from it, and move on. I mean, that's how it makes things bigger, stronger. That's what makes the airline industry so safe, is every time there's a failure, they scrutinize it, they learn from it, and they improve the pr process from it. Cool. They Sim don't do that in cars. Sim simulator is a great place to fail. Um, yeah. You know, you don't, you don't probably want to run two full-size real cars into <laughs> each other very often, and certainly you don't want to run into people. Um, uh, and so sim simulators are great places to fail, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. Um, but there's nothing in my experience, in terms of learning about reliability and like getting one of these things to work in the real world, there's no substitute for putting a few in the real world. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And I think with that, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So I know that we have a mic over there. So if anyone has any questions, and a mic, oh, sorry, and a mic on this side as well. So I see somebody in the back. Um, how will the introduction of 5G change or transform the robotic industry? How does the uh, 5G change the robotic industry as we move to the next generation of wireless? Uh -huh. Hopefully it'll make it better and faster and safer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, cars talking to each other is a great thing. If, they, if I knew that the car in front of me on the 101 yesterday was going to hit the brakes, I'm, I may have been able to avoid an accident if they would have told me that earlier. So I, I hope that it actually makes things safer, faster. Yes, actually, so it's very interesting. So both ways, so there are a lot of uh, interesting work you can do um, uh, with robotic localization mm -hmm. um, using 5G or standards related to 5G. Um, and also the other way, um, use unmanned vehicles to extend the connectivity of the, the cellular coverage. So, so that's, that's pretty interesting. I, I talked earlier about the fact that I don't have to have ideas, I just have to recognize them. But that, that said, <laughs> when I hear 5G, I'm like, okay, commoditization of really high data throughput. And I think about the limitations of data throughput that I see in stuff today. And a lot of it's sending video around, right? You put five video cameras, you put five 4K cameras on a robot and try to stream that, right? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's hard to write it to a, to a hard drive, but... Uh, so what can you, I, I would be asking what can you do that is currently blocked with really high streaming, streaming rate videos? And what are, the, what are the most valuable problems that you can solve with that that are the easiest to tackle? <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, let's go over here. This was partially discussed, but intuitively, every ro robot puts quite a few people out of work. On the other hand, all of your companies are employing uh, lots of people. I'm just curious to know what your prediction is of the balance between forced unemployment and new employment in, say, 10 years from now. Uh, I mean, there's a couple books written on it that said anything that could be the three A's, if it could be automated in abundance or sent to Asia, you shouldn't probably invest in it. Uh, <laughs> and, or you shouldn't try to go get a college degree in that. You know, I'd also not go get a PhD in internal combustion engines. I think that's going to be a thing of the past as well. I mean, you could say the same thing about people who, are, uh, who made horseshoes for a living. Oh, God, that job's gone. I mean... There's been a lot of uh, redundant industries that have created new industries that have flourished and created a ton of jobs. We create a ton of jobs in Santa Barbara. You know, we're up to uh, over 150 people in Santa Barbara, and none of that existed five years ago. So it's okay. Technology's okay. Let it, let it go. Let it be. Let it flourish. Don't try to stamp it down and say, oh, your job's going to go away. So... I think it's mostly shifting jobs over the medium to longer term. My fear is, you know, I mentioned earlier that the acceleration is such that in the short term there can be job loss. And if we move fast enough, the job loss in the short term can become quite significant. How we as a society deal with that, I don't know. I'm not the policy guy. But I'd love to talk to the policy people. They don't know what's going on. Yeah, and, and I'll say doing machine learning, I mean, a lot of my job is to take very remedial tasks, not necessarily robotics, but data entry, data analysis, and automate that away. Um, I think that that's exciting. Like, like Paul and Tim said, it leads to brand new industries. I, my job didn't exist 10 years ago because the hardware and the software didn't exist. And now I exist. Someday, I'll probably be automated away as well. Who knows what I'll do after that? Uh, yes. So, 
you know, in, in this whole environment, especially in AI, we, we are actually the commodity. The data that we produce is the commodity. And I feel myself more and more wanting to be able to just turn everything off and be able to do something without being monitored or checked. And it's getting harder and harder with things happening in uh, the home now with, you know, the you're turning on your lights and setting your temperature to the right. So, like, other than, you know, going as far as the GDPR and the EU, what can we do to sort of mitigate the uh, value that people get from us so that we can live a private life? I'll, I'll start with that one, actually. So GDPR, for everyone that doesn't know, is the General Data Privacy Regulations. It's a new law enacted in the EU to protect privacy. We had a law in California that was watered down for a whole bunch of reasons, but it still exists to, again, protect our privacy. Um, I think that we as a society are so far from understanding what the right, what the right middle ground is that we just don't know where we're going. I mean, you see these things where Facebook and Google preeminent, you know, predominantly, but other companies as well, were collecting all this data. And even in my field personally, three years ago, big data was the hottest thing, right? What is big data? Just the accumulation of data. That actually doesn't have any value, right? Great, I know all these, I, you know, but I haven't done anything, right? Artificial intelligence and machine learning allows us to action upon these. So we've, we've as a society made a trade-off, that we're willing to get products for free in exchange for giving our data, right? Facebook is free because we give our data. Google is free because we give our data. There is starting to become an industry, stuff like search engines, like DuckDuckGo, or, you know, there's social networks that basically are privacy focused that come up and say exactly this. If you want privacy, we provide you a lesser service because we don't know as much about you, but in exchange, we'll, you'll have anonymity. And I think we as a society need to decide if we're gonna put our dollars, our eyeballs on those services that promote privacy or not, and I don't think we know the answer yet. It's well said. <laughs> <laughs> agree, yeah. Cool. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah. Um, so my question was, um, so do you think it would be possible with um, the the vast changes in economy that are predicted with automation? Um, for a society to result in which there were large numbers of people who just didn't work but received a basic living wage or some new arrangement like that that's been proposed? No. <laughs> I was going to say, get, who wants to comment on universal basic income? <laughs> go get a real job. It's okay. Go do something. Go create something. It's, it's totally okay to create something. The basic income thing, I mean, this isn't Russia. <laughs> I hate to say, I hate to break for your bubble. Um, go create something. Go out and work hard. It's okay. <laughs> I'll say from, my, Sorry. from where I sit, I, I think it's an interesting discussion that's decades of policy making away before we come to any conclusion. It's, it's too early to tell. I mean, who knows? Like, that's the right thing to be thinking about, but I think it's, it's a long ways away. Yes. All right, so uh, a couple months ago, I heard the Elon Musk podcast with Joe Rogan, and the burning question <laughs> on my mind is, you know, what are the chances that this AI is malevolent versus our best friend, or do we become them? I've also been watching Westworld. <laughs> you guys want to comment on, are we becoming AI? I, I, I'm an optimist myself, <laughs> I'll say. Um, I do watch Westworld and Black Mirror for that matter, but I am an optimist myself. Today's applications are so narrow and so constrained in terms of the controls that they have to impact on the world that I, I think you can pretty easily build a robot that you don't have to worry about those things much with today. I'm an optimist because I think we'll get better and better and more sophisticated and more sophisticated about controlling those developments as we go. And, and we have time to do it. And so personally, I think that we can keep our hands around it. But that's... And I'll put that kind of in perspective. We, it's probably been in the last five years, if not less, that we've even had the hardware to mimic the human brain. Evolution has had billions of years to take that hardware and build the right software. We're just starting. We're so far away from generalized intelligence as to say, it's, it's science fiction right now. The idea that we could build a robot that has all the actuation that you know, we need to do to do stuff like open doors, let alone launch missiles. 
The much greater threat, in my opinion, is having these systems act not in a way that's necessarily bad, but that their objectives are not aligned with ours. Right? If you say, hey, we want to end a war, and you, know, and you do a machine learning algorithm, well, kill all the people, we'll end the war. The machine didn't do anything wrong. It did exactly what it was told to do. We just didn't anticipate it. That could happen, and that could be more near term. I just, just, I just got reminded there was an article recently in the, in the news. I don't know if anybody saw it. I don't remember all the details, but there was this, the, there were some researchers training a, a machine learning pipeline to teach it, do some association with images and localization. Um, but basically, it learned to actually cheat, and there was an easier way to just kind of figure out where the labels were. And it's not like, I mean, the news portrayed as, oh, the robots are, you know, they're, they're, you know AI is cheating, and they're in that way, but it was really, it, it was told to do something, and there was a goal, and basically that cheating was the best way to get it, essentially. So it just learned that. So, so it was interesting uh, in that sense. And we see that coming out of conferences like, um, it's not called NIPS anymore, it's now NeurIPS. It's one of the preeminent machine learning conferences. Like I talked about fairness. Really, how do you know that something's fair, that it's acting how you want? This is you know, stuff like understandable and interpretable machine learning has gotten you know, a, lot of a lot of press lately. Uh, there's, I can go into ethical concerns, you know, there's algorithms out there that try and predict whether somebody's going to be a parolee, is going to reoffend. turns out it's terribly racial. Just because race was a feature it had, and police arrest people of certain races more often than others, so that's a good predictor of reoffension if reoffension is arrest. So, again, it's not them becoming, like, um, not them inspiring, like having consciousness, it's just doing the action they're told, but in a way that we didn't expect. Uh, sure. Hi. Um, I feel like there's this narrative that emerges in tech industries where it's this interesting combination or acknowledgement of policymakers know nothing, we know everything, but also they're the policymakers, so they should figure out the bigger questions about how society is going to be affected by these things that do genuinely take away jobs and have these really large impacts. So I kind of want to press a little more. Do you think that you are responsible for the technologies you're creating? Do you assess risks at a larger scale? And do you try to develop ways to mitigate how those risks could ripple out into society? You know, we look at something like a car mm -hmm. and at the surface, the data shows that there are going to be less fatalities and less car accidents, and that's fantastic. But when a car kills someone, the car doesn't feel bad about it. The car doesn't go to jail. So what do you do to hold these areas responsible? How is industry responsible for affecting change and being responsible for the mistakes that it makes? Uh, there's a lot there, that you just said. <laughs> so I don't know how to dissect that exactly, but you know, policymakers are totally at a disadvantage because they're in D.C. or in Brussels making decisions without all the facts. It's our responsibility, as my point of view, as technologists, to go and make policymakers aware of the technology and to enlighten them on the policies that need to be um, put forth and hope that they make the right decision and, and hope that my peer group also goes and tells the policy or enlightens the policymakers on the technology and what's going on. So uh, that's, that's, I think, the first part of your question, I hope. <laughs> um, as far as, what was the second part of your question? I, <laughs> I mean, yeah, so you know, if a person goes and kills a person, then yeah, they go to jail or there's insurance that happen. But the big question is what happens when machines start killing people? And I think that's already started happening. And uh, that's the real kind of issue of who pays for that? Who pays the liability of that? Uh, does the car need an insurance underwriting to happen? You know, one really interesting thing that we didn't talk about that I work on a lot is what's going to happen to the insurance companies when people stop driving cars and machines start driving cars? Does you have to get your machine a policy of State Farm to underwrite the fact that that bad car can't kill people or can't cause damages? It's going to be interesting to see what happens. And the insurance companies are freaking out because they don't know how to insure that. Well, I'll say I don't agree with the statement that policymakers don't know anything and we know everything <laughs> at all. <laughs> I, I would say I probably know uh, more about technology than policymakers, but I, they know way more about policymaking than me. I will also say same, we're, we are responsible for what our machines do, absolutely. We're also responsible, I believe, and I do speak regularly with people both in Sacramento as well as Washington, D.C., 
to try to engage in an interactive conversation. Neither one of us knows all the answers on both sides. And the best thing I think that we can do right now is have these interactive back and forth conversations about it. I learn things about policy. They learn things about technology. They're probably going to be the ones that come up with the policy solutions, not, not me. And that's fine. But I, I, I want the interactive conversations. And that's why I asked for it earlier tonight as well, because I, I don't mind doing more of that. Yeah, I, I think keeping the communication open, I think that should be the key. And I can't, it's really a difficult question because this has only been a reality in the last couple of years. When I started out in machine learning, the fact that we could predict anything was cool. Like I didn't care, you know, about the ethical ramifications because I could predict if a given, you know, pixel in an image was contributing to Alzheimer's, you know, making your hippocampus shrink and contributing to Alzheimer's disease. I don't think of the ethical ramifications. These are interesting discussions. I look at it as a positive because the technology has just evolved to a point where we even have to talk about this. So it is a discussion, but it's also a really cool one. Uh, we got a question here? Yeah. Uh, thank you for your, uh, your wonderful discussions tonight. And I just want to ask, all of you went through some sort of educational program. I'm an educator, and uh, education is, a, of course, the type of things I like to to discuss, you're actually from an educational institution, but all of you had went through some sort of educational process to get to where you're at today. Um, do you think that the future uh, will demand change in our educational systems today to prepare uh, the workforce that we're talking about? Um, do, you, do you affirm the educational institutions that we have today to prepare for our workforce in the future, or do you think they need to be modified, or do you think that they should be totally overhauled, or you know, what, what do you think about um, the education of our society today to get to where we're at in the future. Start with the professor. <laughs> <laughs> you would think so, right? <laughs> so, well, one thing that has become more and more evident is uh, online learning and the, f the fact that a lot of the classes are being offered online, and that is, uh, that is a great thing because it's creating really possibilities for people in a lot of uh, other countries that may not have access to education um, to be able to take these wonderful classes. So that, I mean, the, the, the virtual part is becoming more and more uh, real. <laughs> and uh, so that is really one trend. But in terms of, I mean, so this is we're talking about it's like in a college or grad school, but if you're talking about loss of jobs and things like that, certainly you want to train the, the retrain uh, people. So that's a separate story. But, but for my in academic uh, in academia, certainly um, being able to have the virtual access to information, that is a big thing. So uh, education programs that make people memorize things and fit into a certain standardized test, I think is horrible. Um, and uh, so if you could create a way that teach students how to create and how to think for themselves and how to constantly look at a problem and think of other ways of fixing that instead of how to memorize a certain thing is really going to be the game changer. That's going to differentiate and continue to differentiate ourselves from other countries. Uh, killing arts in schools, I think, is the worst thing that educators could do to try to push people to other places. <laughs> and uh, you know, where I went to high school is interesting when you let the math and science wing, and I'm going to mix this up, but it said none of this would be possible without math and science, and you left the arts wing and said none of it would matter without the arts. So think of those two things and, and push that into your students and say, be able to create or ask them, don't just memorize this, but why? Why is this this way? And how, how can you actually impact society with some type of innovation and be, o be okay to fail is also super important in education and understand why you failed and how you fix that failure and make things better going forward. And I, I'm certainly a fan of, of the system, you know. Uh, I've got a couple degrees myself, and almost everybody that I invest in does as well. Uh, so I think they're doing something right. At least it's working for me and for the companies that I invest in. And I think it is adapting and adjusting, and it will continue to do. And I'll echo what Tim said. Learning to learn is the biggest thing yeah. that our schools can teach us. And learning to love to learn is really important. And, and you see a lot of not only colleges and graduate schools, but also like boot camps. I mean, I've interacted with a number of data science boot camps I've talked at. And the goal is to say, hey, you love to learn. You have this base, you know, base of knowledge. We're going to point you in the right direction to get a job in that field. And I know that there's stuff that exists for software, for product development, that I'll try and do these. 
I think that industry is still evolving, but yeah, learning to love to learn is, God, that's the most important thing I could instill upon students. So, cool. Uh, where are we next? I just wanted to uh, push a little bit more on kind of the, the potential for losing control over technology. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I used to laugh out loud when people would talk about Skynet and science fiction and all that thing. You guys are actually giving me less confidence uh, with your answers tonight. And I guess there's a few, few points that I'd like to just have you comment again on. One is, rather than each individual robot having software that is dealing with the environment around it, when you have a million vehicles on the road, they can become a network instantly. So when you have machine learning that's starting to understand problems faster, better, differently than humans do, and you have a network, and you have uh, the ability to actually have machines code and write software faster, better than we do, isn't there the potential to actually begin to lose control? Whether it's, I don't mean it to mean the robots want to take over and kill all humans, but You've already sort of explained several ways that robots can address a problem in ways we don't expect. If we have a network of robots or many networks of robots or sensors or drones, whatever it is, it seems to me there's two scary potentials. One is you have a few corporations who have tremendous influence over all of us, and the other is the potential to lose control over what uh, machine learning does with the technology that we've deployed. Let me put your fears and concern. Every time I write a piece of software, the first line I says, if Skynet, stop. So like, we're good on the yeah. Skynet. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that more than what we're drilling in on is the unintended consequences, right? When we think about machine learning, we talk about things called loss functions. So we have an objective that we want to meet, right? It's recognizing if there's a person. And we have a loss function. And the loss function is, how much did we miss that by, right? Machine learning really, the, the difference between machine learning and traditional programming is in traditional programming, you tell exactly what to do. And this is like traditional robots. Do this, 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 and arrive at my, my conclusion, my objective. In machine learning, you just say, I have a bunch of data. You figure it out, but this is what I'm doing, right? You're right, if some corporation went out there and said, my objective is to kill everyone, and that's, I'm training all these robots, that would be really bad, but also really obvious, right? Um, so what we need to do is understand exactly what our objectives are, but recognize that machines are going to do them in totally different ways. I've seen this play out in the chess stuff that I had mentioned. If you ever look at chess masters today, the games they study are mostly played by robots. Because the robots are solving chess in such an interesting way, and we can actually learn from that. It's not only bad, it's also good. So I think that you know, this whole idea of are they becoming sentient and taking over is still very far-fetched. I mean, I, you guys can disagree with me. But like this idea of them solving problems in unique ways that are potentially harmful but potentially good, is, that is happening right now. I just want to mention, you said team, like a team over them, and so we work a lot uh, in the research domain. That's still in the research domain, but there's a lot of work we do and my colleagues do. A team of um, unmanned vehicles, like even a swarm of them, and so there's a lot of really exciting things you can do with them. Uh, so that's, that's super exciting. Um, or, or you can even have like dust robots and throw them, you know, through something uh, under a door or something, and then they can build all sorts of understanding about the environment. But they will do what you told them to do, basically. And so, you know, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> all, all the autonomous vehicles that I've seen have multiple redundant. I want to, I want to put you a little bit at ease. <laughs> <laughs> multiple redundant uh, overrides, such that although they normally just cruise around and do their own thing, you. Every single one I've seen has a button you can push that just tells it stop. Just stop right where you are. They usually have a come home button for like if it's not, if it's not looking dangerous or anything weird, like just bring it home. Tell it to stop doing whatever it's doing and just come home. In the case of the flying ones, they usually have parachutes even though they have all these other redundant o overrides as well. All, all of which sit architecturally at a level above what the machine controlling the stuff does. So at least the machines made by the good 
guys, so to speak, mm -hmm. I think we can maintain control over in ways like that. Um, you have to start talking about the mad scientist who's smart enough to build a chaos robot that he doesn't, that he unleashes without control of. It's, The, the robots that I've been seeing today, I, I mentioned earlier, are using machine learning and AI primarily for vision, so just to see and identify stuff. They're actually using closed loop controls most of the time to, to steer and to determine where they're going to go next. So it's, it's not like the AI can suddenly decide to do something different than close that feedback loop, you know? Yeah, and that's what reinforcement learning is, like that I had talked about, is basically closing that. It, it, like, it's really cool what we can do, but it's so rudimentary compared to anything meaningful, like actually like what a person can actually do. Yes. I am uh, super interested in the panel's take on more of a utopian future. Um, <laughs> I know that we've got potential with any technology to harness it for good and uh, harness it for not so good. Um, climate change is a lot on my mind, and population growth. And I'm very curious to hear each of your opinions on your projections for the, you know, you talk about r really rudimentary jobs that are going to be taken over by robots. How do you see that impacting population growth worldwide? And how do you see that impacting the uh, future of environmental problems? Start. You're going to throw that right to me? Great. Go for it. <laughs> Super simple question. I'm <laughs> uh, glad you asked it. Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, uh, <clears throat> right now, there's a super amount of inefficiencies that robots could have. I mean, environmental is a big one. I used to drive an hour and a half to work every day in my V8 vehicle. I'm sure that didn't do a lot of great things to the environment, especially if there was a group of us doing the same thing. Uh, you know, trucks that drive down the street uh, at 5 p.m. is not a great thing. If we could make them be on the road at, at between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. is probably a lot better thing for the environment and society. But um, you're going to see things change, and hopefully when they change, there's going to be, with machine learning and robotics, you're going to start taking inefficiencies out of it, and inefficiencies drive a lot to the environmental issues as far as everyone driving to work at the same time all the trucks going down the highway at the same time. It's completely insane. If you ever drive from here to LA at two in the morning, you're gonna get there really fast, and you're not gonna really use a lot of fossil fuels to do that. And I think things like that, it could really help the environment and when people um, work. Farming in places outside of um, you know, cities is gonna be a good thing, uh, because that's a lot more efficient than doing it right in the middle of a city. So hopefully that'll help. I mean, I think they're doing lots of great things today, and they're going to keep doing more. Um, I've, I've seen people working on solar-powered fishes that pick up plastic in the ocean. Yeah. I've seen people working on robots that help elderly people from falling, one of our largest uh, trouble causers in the health system today, and such a seemingly simple mechanical thing. It's a sort of a perfect disruption. Um, and, and on and on and on and on. What Zipline's doing? with making sure that people have the right medicine in the right place at the right time with no waste in the system is, is I, I think, amazing. And so, I, yeah, I, I said earlier I'm, uh, I'm an optimist, and I, I do think all these things are going to get built. I just want to add, so um, being able to have um, cheap embedded sensors and have a sensor network, that would allow um, to, to do a lot of environmental monitoring. So, for instance, glacier monitoring, you know, with these little sensors you can build and you can put inside the glaciers and so you can you know, track their movement in terms of what's going on with the climate. So there, there are a lot of things that are possible now with um, the cheap sensing, AI automation, which is, which is, which is great. Yeah, and I'll just add one more from my professional experience is uh, dealing with nuclear waste. So if you guys remember, like, Fukushima sending in robots there, mm -hmm. I used to work for a company that did dosimetry, which is measuring the amount of dose you get, and it turns out a robot can take all the dose until it dies, and who cares, you get another robot. So there's a lot of things that robots can do to make us so much more efficient and therefore do stuff like help with climate change. So, 
iRobots had a ton of robots in there. <laughs> they <laughs> yeah. did. Yeah. Not just, they just don't make vacuum cleaners. They actually make military-grade uh, robots. Very cool. That went in there after, the, after that nuclear situation happened. So one more. Please. Um, yeah, I think a buzzword that it's inspired a lot of fear, especially after the last election cycle, is hacking. <laughs> and whether uh, that is a legitimate fear or not, I'm just kind of curious if that's something going forward that we'll find a solution to, that people will stop being afraid of if it even is a legitimate fear, or if it's something that's just going to take time to kind of go away and kind of fade from public perception. So when you mean hack, hacking has a lot of meanings, right? Uh, it can be everything from social engineering, I convince you to give me your password, I hacked you, right? Uh, to these massive data breaches, you look at stuff like you know Equif or Experian, Equifax, whichever had the major data breach, all the way to Facebook, you know, spreading disinformation campaigns. In all of these, it was human actors using specialized tools to do something. It wasn't the machine said, "Hey, you know, I'm just going to throw out everyone's credit information because I feel like it." Uh, it wasn't face. It, even you look at Facebook. I don't. I mean. Guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe Facebook wanted to spread disinformation. What they were interested in is keeping you on the page, because when you're on the page, they make more money, right? It's an interesting question to say, you know, is Facebook actually responsible? Are we responsible? Is the government responsible? I don't know, but I can tell you the machines are, don't care, right? So I think that this is more of a societal question that we have to really take in and, and try and answer, and it's not easy. I just want to add from a different angle, there's also a lot of research on how to build resilient systems, so it can basically resilient networks that it can figure out this is, a, this, this is not a team player, this is the adversary. So there's a lot of interesting work along those lines to increase the robustness to those things. It, it is a very real concern, I will say, to all of the robot makers that I've spoken with. Um, you know, one way to help beat it is to not communicate. So a Roomba maybe doesn't need to be connected, for, it for, does. for instance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and, but then you go up from there and you say, OK, like, what does the communication layer and protocol have access to? What can it influence? What can it do in the system? And the, all the robots that I've seen have been very, there's been a lot of thought put into that. I'm not saying it's not possible to make a mistake, but there's a lot of thought put in. And again, there's layers of redundancy that's designed on purpose uh, because it is a concern. There's a huge industry also for anti-hacking. You know, in the car world, I see a lot of money and a lot of companies trying to put barriers and barricades around the ability to hack. So just as many people are trying to make cars be robotic, there's a ton of people trying to make sure it's safe, and that's, that's a good thing. Well, I wanted to say we've had so many great questions and such a great panel. Um, Give our panel a big hand and thank them for coming tonight. <laughs>